Hey, thanks, you guys. And thank you for putting up with us not being Braden. Uh, I know that's a crushing blow what a let to down. everyone. Yeah, it's a big letdown. Um, he's, he's sick, and we're, it takes two of us to make a Braden, but we're gonna do, <laughs> we're gonna do our best. So uh, as, as mentioned, John and I work together with Braden on this book, Sprint, and we're gonna talk to you about the Sprint process today. But since you guys are captive there, you know, you just sat down, it would be really weird if you just got up right away and left. I'm gonna tell you a little bit of my life story. And I'm gonna go back to, not all the way back, this is just about a, you know, a tenth of the way back, but to 2003, when my oldest son, Luke, was born. This is when I, the, the year I became a father. And if any of you have kids, you might be familiar with the feeling of kind of freaking out when your first child is born. I freaked out in a lot of different ways, actually, but the way that's sort of topical to the sprint process is that when I went back to work after Luke was born, this is a picture of Luke as a, as a baby, and actually the real full-size 12-year-old uh, Luke is right over here, if you guys wanna see, <laughs> this is what happens, uh, time passes. But he started out like this, and, and when I went back to work, I realized that when I was at work, Luke was gonna be growing up. He was, you know, life was gonna continue to happen. And every day that I was in the office, I was missing out on some of that, that life that was going on at home. And these days I worked at, at Microsoft, on Microsoft Encarta. I don't know if anybody remembers Microsoft Encarta, but it was an encyclopedia, which is like Wikipedia, uh, only it was on uh, CD-ROMs. Uh, CDs are like these sort of silver Frisbees that have information on them. It was a long time ago, but when I took that job, when I, when I started to work on Encarta, I was so excited about educating kids and building products that could help people learn. And, and I realized when I, I came back from my, my leave when Luke was born and I looked at sort of my day-to-day -day schedule that so much of what I did wasn't closely tied to that optimistic vision of, of, of why I'd signed up. My days were filled with meetings, you know, as, as you know, most folks who work in offices days are. There were meetings on there that I had, you know, scheduled other people and they would say yes and people would schedule me and I'd say yes. There were status meetings for project A and decision making meetings for project B and brainstorming meetings for project C. And I realized that if I wanted to get anything important done, I had to kind of wind my way through this obstacle course of, of meetings. And so I decided, you know, I, I've got to make good use of my time when I'm at the office, when I'm away from, from what I thought of as sort of real life. And so I, I want to, in those gaps, I want to be as productive as possible. So I got David Allen's Getting Things Done book and I read it like three times cover to cover and I had design mentors and I, I talked to them and tried to get as, as good as possible at prioritizing my work and doing my work in an efficient way and got to the point where in any of those gaps, I felt like I could really take the most important thing and get it done. And, and so I worked at Microsoft for a few years and then in 2007, I went to go work at Google. And when, in, in those days, at least to me, Google, that was like the coolest thing. I couldn't wait to see how they, how they worked inside of Google. And you know, I, I thought, like, what's it, what's it gonna be like? How do they do their sort of day-to-day -day schedule? As a process nerd, this was, this was really interesting to me. And it turned out it was pretty much exactly the same. <laughs> but, um, but, but what I found at Google that was, that was very interesting was that there was this sort of culture of experimentation. So it was evident before I'd come into the company, and in those days, you guys probably remember like Gmail was in beta for like a decade or something, and, and there was a lot of this idea of, you know, you, you test your products maybe before they're ready on the outside world, and that's how we'll learn and get to the, the best outcomes. That was sort of the philosophy. But that philosophy of experimentation existed inside the company as well. And so what, what happened was uh, I got this idea in my head about experimenting with, with process, with the way not just I spend my time, but the way the team spent their time. And so I, I thought, what would happen if you could wipe the calendar clear and, and sort of redesign the work week? And so over the course of, of years of kind of experimenting with things and failing a, a lot of the time, I came up with this process that I called a design sprint. And the idea was just to focus on one thing for a week, get the team together, do some things that came from sort of design thinking workshops, do some things that came from kind of the hackathons that happened at Google, and try to create a prototype in a single week. And then in 2012, I went to go work at Google Ventures, which is now just called GV, because with the whole alphabet thing, we lost the rest of our letters. 
But at any rate, at, at GV, we invest in startups. And the idea was that a sprint might be a way for startups to, to quickly test ideas. And so over the past few years, I've been working with John and with Braden and the rest of my colleagues to kind of perfect this process for startups. And we've, we've experimented a lot, we've tried a bunch of different things and come up with a formula that we've found works reliably in all kinds of, of domains. The reason why this is so useful for a startup is that if you're running a startup, and you guys will be familiar with this, whatever size company you're at, there's all these ideas you have about how to execute on the opportunity or the, the problem that you're trying to solve. And you know when you're setting out, when you're trying to choose which of these myriad paths to take, you know that some of them, if you do it right, you know there might be a really big business there. But a lot of them are sort of worth pennies on the dollar. And some of those ideas might actually be actively dangerous. But up front, you, you don't know for sure which is which. So as a, as a founder, as a leader in a company, you have to sort of follow your, your best hunch. You have to look at all those ideas, pick one, and, and build it. And people know that they, they're not gonna be right 100% of the time. They know that it's hard to predict what's gonna happen in the real world. So this idea of sort of build, measure, learn, this, this is a very commonly accepted approach in, in Silicon Valley and really around the world. But if you've done this, you also know there's, there's some problems with this. It's hard to know how big of a product to build. It's hard to know how long it's gonna to take to build something. Usually this sort of building and launching process takes much, much longer than we think. And, and so things crop up. The longer it takes to build, the more sort of arguments there are. And, and after you launch, if you get it wrong, of course, you're sort of doing damage control. And even if everything goes well and you get that data, it can be really hard to know why the data is what it is. We found, uh, I remember working on Gmail, and we'd, you know, we'd launch something, and it millions, I don't know, it was hundreds of millions. I recently read there's like a billion users on Gmail. You have all these metrics of where people are clicking, but it can still be unclear why they're doing it, if they're accomplishing the things that you hoped, if it's really meeting what you set out to accomplish with your vision. So with all of these potential arguments in mind, it's, it's natural that people become risk averse when they're setting out on building something. And they, they argue a lot and they wanna get it right. And sometimes they kinda back away from the biggest opportunities. The idea with the sprint was that you could contract all of that down and actually get some data right away in as fast as a week. And we thought if we could make it fast enough that it didn't take away from the longer term building process, it could really be a, a boost to our startups, to our investments. So that's the sprint process that we're gonna talk to you about today. The big idea is to build and test a prototype in just five days. And John is gonna walk you through how it works. Yeah, so since Jake joined us at GV in 2012, we've done over 100 of these sprints. We've really refined and tweaked the process so it fits very neatly into, into a five day work week. And we're really confident in the, in the process. The, the results are, are reliable. You know you're gonna learn something. You know you're gonna make progress. And I'll walk you through what happens. Before every sprint, we start by assembling the team. This might seem kind of obvious, but we like to say that it's, it's the real team. It's not like a, a special team. It gets to go off and they get to do the sprint and it's like a fun creative project. It's the team who's working on these things day in and day out. We think that, that most teams, they already have the skills and they have the knowledge and the expertise that they need to solve their problems and, and reach their goals, but they kind of get in their own ways. They kind of, you know, they struggle to work together and to be efficient and to use their time well. And the sprint is a way for that team to work better together. So in the course of five days, we're gonna build this prototype, we're gonna test it with customers, but we have to make sure that we use our time really efficiently and we have to make sure that we're focused. So on Monday, what we do is we wanna really understand the problem before we start to try to solve it. The first thing that we do in the sprint is to start at the end. So we start by, uh, by talking about the long-term goal. So beyond the sprint itself, what are we trying to do? This is an example from Flatiron Health, and they're a company that makes software for cancer clinics. And their big goal in the sprint that we did with them was to, uh, was to get more cancer patients into clinical trials. It's good for the patients, good for the doctors, good for the, the pharmaceutical company, good for the, the scientific sort of progress of, of cancer care. Um, but they knew that they had some, some big questions, some, some hurdles that could trip them up along the way toward their goal. And so we start with this goal, we start with these questions, but before we try to solve it, we wanna make sure that everyone has the same understanding of the problem. 
So on Monday, we create a map. And this is basically showing how the customer experiences the product or service that we're designing. So you know, in the case of Flatiron, they've got patients and they've got doctors and they've got the clinical research coordinators, the people who actually run the studies, the clinical trials. And they're going through and they're sort of going through all these steps and they're interacting together and, and they're getting to the, the goal at the end, which is to get the, the patient enrolled in, in a clinical trial. But it's, it's big and it's complex and it's, it's not straightforward and it would be crazy to try to do all this stuff in one week. So the last thing that we do on Monday is we pick a target. And this is the most important opportunity or the biggest risk that exists in this map. And it's tied back to our goal and it's tied back to those questions that we wrote down earlier in the day on Monday. We want to figure out what's the thing that we can do this week? What's the thing that we can test that's going to help us take one step closer to our goal? All right, so we spent a whole day on Monday talking about the problem, trying to understand it. And then on Tuesday, we finally get to, get to try to solve it. But we don't do any group brainstorming. Instead, we have people work as individuals. So, that, so they're actually taking their ideas and they're putting them down on paper. When you do a brainstorm, there's a couple of issues. One is that uh, the ideas are all abstract, and ideas tend to sound much better in abstract than they are in reality. And the other issue is that you, if you have somebody who's, who's a very powerful and eloquent speaker, or somebody who has a lot of uh, sort of uh, you know, sway in the organization, that person's ideas are going to be valued more highly than other people. So we have people take their ideas and write them down. And each person produces one of these super detailed sketches. It's not a work of art, you know, it's something that, that anybody can do and we've had everybody from designers to engineers to salespeople to marketers do these sketches. But it's a way of taking your idea and making it concrete. You're sort, of, you're sort of making a bet. You're sort of saying, I bet that if we design and build this thing, it's going to help us get to our goal. So in a typical sprint, we end up with 10 or more of these different competing solutions. And again, we're doing a five-day sprint, so we cannot prototype and test all of them. So we have to decide. We have to figure out which of these ideas are the most promising, most likely to help us get where we're trying to go. And, and prototype and test those. And that's what we do on Wednesday. We decide which ideas to prototype. Now, there are a lot of things that groups are really great at, like, for example, working, you know, coming up with lots of different ideas. But groups kind of suck at making decisions about things. And I'm sure you've felt this. Uh, maybe you, know, you talk and talk, and you try to reach consensus. You want everybody to be, to be you know, everybody to agree with the outcome. But really, nobody's ever happy with the outcome. You know, it's sort of watered down. Or maybe you, you can't reach a decision as a group, and so somebody just kind of goes off on their own and makes the call without consulting or without talking to the rest of the team. We want to try to fix those problems. And so in the sprint, we use a series of structured decision-making exercises. So we have people look at the sketches and use little sticky dots to vote on the parts that they think are the best. And then we do something called a speed critique. It's not quite this fast, but, but it's pretty fast, where, where we go around and we have each person talk for just three minutes. We actually set a timer, just three minutes, about what they like, what they don't like about, about each of the ideas and the sketches. And after we've heard from everybody in the sprint, then we rely on that decision maker, the decider, to make the call about what we're going to prototype, what we're going to test with customers. So the decider looks at all the votes, all the things that people have written down and talked about, and then decides, this is what we're going to put in our prototype. This is the thing that I want to test that's going to get us closer to our goal. So I'll illustrate this by talking about a, a sprint that we did with Slack. And Slack has been growing like crazy. They, uh, they have 3 million uh, daily active users uh, after just a couple years, you know, a couple years since launch. But if we go back in time a little bit, their initial customers, their early adopters, were all tech companies, right? They're people who sort of, they got what Slack was all about. But they reached a point about a year after launch where they said, you know what, I think we're ready to reach a, a new kind of customer. I think we're ready to really expand the business. And so they decided to do a national advertising campaign. And this is the type of ad that you'd expect to see, like, on the 101 south of San Francisco, you know, there's ads for all sorts of weird things. But, but, uh, but these ads were, were everywhere. Um, I actually saw an ad on the side of a bus for Slack in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, last week when I was there. So, so they're all over. And they knew that when people started to see these ads, they, they, would, they would wonder what Slack was. They would say, how does Slack help me get 48% less email? They're going to go to slack.com. They're going to try to understand this product. Um, and they wanted to be really sure that those customers would understand the product. 
So that's what the sprint was about, was how to explain Slack to a non-tech customer. And in the course of the sprint, we came up with two different ideas, two competing solutions for how we might solve that problem. One was, uh, was, was clever, it was really clever, it was really smart, it was kind of a sophisticated idea. Um, it was also the CEO's favorite um, idea, and it, but it was, gonna be, it was gonna be difficult to build. It was gonna take a lot of design and engineering work to make it work right. The other idea was, it kind of seemed obvious. It was like really simple, it was really straightforward, but the team thought you know, maybe it could work. Um, it was gonna be a lot easier to build, so they were interested in seeing if it was an effective idea, if it was gonna test well with, with their customers. Now, in most uh, sort of typical design and, and product development processes, you have to decide on an idea. You have to argue, you have to debate, you have to figure out which of these ideas are we gonna pursue? And then you can go through that loop that Jake described with the you know, building it and launching it and measuring it and, and figuring out what worked. But in a sprint, we can actually keep multiple competing solutions alive and we can pit them head, head to head in something that we call a rumble. And that's exactly what we did in the sprint with Slack. We, we kept these two ideas alive through the course of the sprint, prototyped them both and tested them both. So after we've decided which ideas we, we want to we prototype, we create a storyboard. Um, and this storyboard is basically the blueprint for the prototype that we're going to create on Thursday. And what we want to do with the storyboard is make all of the big decisions so that when people come in to build the prototype on Thursday, remember we only have one day for the prototype, when they come in on Thursday, they don't have to make the big decisions, they can just sit down at the computer and they can just crank away on getting that prototype done. And that's exactly what happens. You know, a lot of the exercises in a sprint can feel a little bit uncomfortable or artificial for some people, but usually by Thursday, uh, people are kind of back to, to what they love to do, what they know best, typically sitting at computers, doing mock-ups, writing code, writing copy, whatever. So everybody works together, everybody has a different job, a different part of the prototype that they're responsible for building. The way that we get this prototype done in one day is that we don't try to create something that's functional or even complete. All we're trying to do is create a realistic facade of that product or of those ideas or of that service. And so sometimes we'll use Keynote to make those mockups. We'll use Sketch. And then we'll pull those mockups into a tool like Envision or Flinto or Marvel, and we'll stitch them together so that they actually look like a real finished product. This is a prototype we made in, uh, in Flinto, I believe. And you know, as you can see, it, it looks like a real app. It's, you know, we didn't have to write any code. We didn't have to figure out all the details and the nooks and crannies. But this is a prototype that looks realistic, that we could build in one day, that we could show to customers. Sometimes you don't actually have to prototype the product itself. Now, uh, when we worked with Orbital Insight, they were considering um, launching basically a new product. They had an existing product line, but they wanted to expand it. And it was gonna, be, um, it was gonna take them probably a couple of years to fully build what they had in mind. So instead of prototyping, trying to prototype that product or some part of that product, we actually prototyped like a pitch deck, like a sales deck that their sales team would use. And their sales team took that to their customers, which were um, hedge fund managers, um, and actually sort of tested that prototype pitch deck by doing, doing sort of a sales pitch to them and learning which parts of that product they liked, which features they liked, what they thought about the pricing, et cetera. We call this a, a brochure facade. It's a way to, to prototype something without having to prototype the product or service itself. When we have multiple competing ideas like we did with Slack, you know, we don't just call them idea A and idea B or you know, the new idea and the old idea. We actually give them brand names so that when we show the prototypes to customers, they're not trying to describe, oh, I like the purple one. They're actually, they're actually reacting to these two prototypes as if they were multiple competing products, as if they were shopping and trying to decide between two products. All right, so Friday is the test. And in a lot of ways, a sprint is really just a big elaborate excuse to run customer research at the end. But you know, whereas in a lot of cases, customer research is kind of dull or boring and people are sitting in a dark room, on Friday of a sprint, when we do the customer test, everybody is really excited. Everybody, they can't wait to find out what's gonna happen because they've got skin in the game. Their, their ideas are being put to the test, being tested with real customers. So one way to think about this test is that it's a way to, to travel into the future. 
right? It's like you were able to get into your DeLorean time machine or you know, whatever kind of time machine you prefer, but travel into the future to a time when your product is already launched. You know, if you've got that long-term goal, you don't have to imagine what it would be like. You can see what it would be like if your product was out and your customers were actually looking at your product for the first time. And the way we do that is with one-on-one -on -one customer interviews. So we can show the customer a prototype, we can see what they do, and we can listen to them talk about what they like, what they don't like, where they're getting stuck, where they're getting confused, what their questions are. While those interviews are going on, we have the rest of the team watching. So watching over a live video feed in a different room and listening and taking notes. And the result is that by the end of the day, we've got basically same day data. We don't have to, the researcher doesn't have to go and write a report and come back and present it to us. We have same day data on which of those ideas worked really well and which things still need more work. So if we go back to our uh, example from the, the Slack sprint, we had Slack which what we're, what we're calling Slack here, which was the really kind of sophisticated, clever idea that was gonna be difficult to build. Um, and then we had Gather, which was kind of the like really straightforward, simple sort of obvious approach to explaining what Slack was. We found out in, in Friday's test that, um, that the, the sort of fancy approach really didn't work at all. People were confused, they didn't get it. And you might think, oh, well that's like, that sucks. Like the, this, this idea that the team loved, that the CEO loved, didn't test very well but they actually saved a huge amount of time. They didn't have to go through that you know, three or six or nine month process of doing all the engineering work to launch this thing because they learned in five days that it actually wasn't likely to be a successful idea. And there was more good news because they found that this relatively simple, straightforward approach to describing the product actually tested really well. People got it, it was really, really straightforward, and that was something that they could, they could build and they could launch very quickly, and that's exactly what they did following the sprint. So we've done over 100 sprints like this, and some of them have been with, with companies you'd expect, like Slack, but uh, we've also done them with healthcare companies and robotics companies and a whole bunch of other things. And uh, before we wrap up today, Jake's gonna tell you a story about a, a sprint that we did with a company called Savvy Oak. Yeah, thanks, John. So Savvy Oak is a company that, you, it's a good chance you haven't heard of Savvy Oak. So if that is the case, here's their mission statement, and I think that'll clear up any questions that you have. But I can also tell you what John told me when he first met with Savvy Oak, which was, my God, they make robots. And uh, well, I was really excited. John was also excited from what I could tell by his volume. Uh, because, you know, robots are, I'm, I mean, I grew up reading science fiction. I'm a science fiction nerd. I was really excited about this, this robot idea. Here's the thing. Savvy Oak was founded by this guy named Steve Cousins. And he used to run this thing called Willow Garage in Silicon Valley. They're basically a robotics experimentation lab. And this is a robot that they, that they built at uh, the PR2 at Willow Garage. Extremely sophisticated, programmable, like incredibly capable hands. Uh, this is at six times normal speed. So you can, you know, it's not quite as scary in real life, but you can see what the robot can do. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It can open the fridge. In a second, you're gonna see it actually opening a, a beer bottle without, you know, strong enough to open the bottle without shattering it, uh, you know, re reluctantly give it to you. <laughs> Pretty impressive, right? So Steve knew that amazing things were possible with robots, but the PR2 cost like tens of millions of dollars to build. And not really something that, you know, most households are gonna wanna adopt. But Steve said, you know, hey look, there's all of this advancement going on in sensor technology, battery technology with the you know, advance of our, our mobile phones. And he realized that he sort of crossed this threshold where it'd be possible to build a, a pretty capable robot, not like the PR2, not with, not with arms, but a very capable robot that could you know, perform tasks autonomously and interact with people in settings where people weren't expecting a robot. That was possible now, it, it maybe like a, a reasonable price point. And so he, he started this company, Savio. He hired a bunch of engineers and roboticists and designers. And they set out to build a robot. Their first robot would be a robot for hotels. So hotels are a nice place to start because it's a very, it's a very known environment. You can figure out the floor plan of a hotel and, and program that into the robot so it knows roughly what it's gonna be encountering and where to go. 
And there's also this job that a robot can do in a hotel. It's a simple job that, that a robot can fulfill quite well. If you work at a front desk of a hotel, uh, your day might look sort of something like this. Now, this is a chart that I, I made up, but I think you could kind of get this idea if you've ever checked into a hotel, and I'm not talking about like a super fancy hotel, just a hotel with you know sort of a, a normal amount of front desk staff, and there's these rush hour peaks where there might be a bunch of people waiting in line at the front desk, and there might also be people up in their rooms who want like a towel or a toothbrush, and they're, they're calling the front desk to say like, hey, like, you know, I, I need a toothbrush. And if you're at the front desk, you've got people there in real life and then people to help in the rooms. And the thought was, well, this robot could make the deliveries. The, the team at Savvy Oak, over the first few months of their existence, built successively more and more sophisticated prototypes of the robot to try to solve this problem. Starting on the, on the left, as you can see with a trash can, and developing all the way to, to this guy on the end, this is the, the relay robot. And so the relay is about, about the height, maybe a little shorter than this lectern, and it's got a little, a little locker on the top. So at the front desk, you could open the, the hatch, put in a, a towel or a toothbrush or a, a juice or something, close the lid, and type in the room number, and then the robot could just drive on its own, call the elevator, ride the elevator with people, the, you know, the door's open, it goes to the room, and then when the door, it gets to the door, it triggers an automatic phone call. When the person opens the door, it senses that the door's opened, and then its hatch pops up, and it's made the delivery. So they thought, you know, this is, this is pretty cool, and a great way to, as an entryway to testing robots that might, you know, assist people in their homes to fulfill, basically, jobs that are, that are can be tough to staff. So, Everything was great. The robot was very capable, very safe, and they had worked out this pilot with the Aloft Hotel down in Cupertino, California. So they had one functioning relay robot, and they were gonna put the robot into service, making deliveries to real hotel guests. But they had this, this one big question, which was how should the robot behave? The robot was, was really well engineered. It could go up to its charging station, plug in, charge itself. It could very safely like, detect if there was somebody or any kind of an obstacle and stop, very cautious, to make the delivery successfully. But they were really worried that with the attention, they knew there would be stories in the press when the robot got out there in the wild. And they wanted to make sure people weren't frustrated or disappointed when they interacted with the robot. Especially they were concerned about people trying to talk to the robot, give the robot commands, or have some kind of a conversation. If you guys have ever had frustrations with your, you know, trying to talk to your phone or, you know, God forbid, trying to, you know, those automated systems like with your bank or something and like it doesn't understand what you're saying. If that was a robot, like they just, they were afraid people would get aggravated and that a, a big frustration like that might kind of sink their whole startup right in the, in the earliest stages. So the way that Steve described this problem was in the context of Asimov's laws. And I don't know if any of you are nerdy enough to be familiar with these, but the, the Isaac Asimov, sci-fi writer from uh, you know, sort of the early days of sci-fi, not the, not the earliest sort of Jules Verne days, but it doesn't really matter. I'm giving myself away as a bit of a nerd. These laws are, even if you're not familiar with them, they've informed a lot of the science fiction that exists today. A lot of our sort of fundamental expectations of what a really sophisticated robot that we could interact with ought to do. And as Steve explained it, you know, this robot is really not, it's not the same kind of deal. It's not gonna be nearly as, as sophisticated. He said, we've been spoiled by Wally -E and C-3PO and we think that robots have thoughts and plans and hopes and dreams and he's like, this robot is just, you know, it's like a, it's just a little cylinder with a toothbrush in it and it's not gonna be able to talk to you or have a conversation or, or even understand your commands. So the safest thing to do was to give the robot no personality, no face, nothing that would inspire people to talk to it or interact with it and have potentially a frustrating experience. But in Steve's vision for the company, in the team's vision for the robot, they had talked a lot about a robot that people would, would love, that people would feel comfortable with. Their long-term vision involved robots in a lot of different settings and they wanted robots that people would feel really comfortable with. And so they thought a lot about giving it a personality, but it was just too risky to, to launch that personality. Too many things could go wrong. They still wondered, so when we started talking to them, we said, hey, you know, this, usually we do sprints at the beginning of a process, but you guys have enough time to still implement the personality. Let's try it. Let's take five days and, and take a risk on it. So 
We cleared five days on the, on the calendar, the, the Savvy Oak team did. And on Monday of the sprint, they actually, they brought the robot, we did the sprint at our office and they brought the robot in. So here it is, hidden under a, a tablecloth as though a, a, you know, a ghost would be less conspicuous than a robot on the Google campus. I don't know, maybe. And so they brought it inside and they took off the tablecloth. This is what we saw. It's, it's, you know, it looks kind of like a printer at first. But when it started moving around, there's something about the robot kind of moving around and it you know, detects you and then it would kind of move around you that like in my brain at least sort of triggered like it's a dog. And, and uh, we, we fell in love with the robot. This is maybe the first hotel robot selfie ever taken. I don't know. It's up there. And, and so anyway, we, the, as John said, on the first day on Monday, we want to make a map of the problem. So we made this map. Where are all the points where a hotel guest might unsuspectingly encounter the robot for the first time and have an interaction with it? We wanted to find the one where there was sort of the biggest risk, the biggest opportunity, and test that one. And so Steve, the CEO, decided on the moment of delivery. So the, in, the, in the sort of hotel room, when you open the door and you're expecting a, a toothbrush and you don't know there's going to be a robot there, that's like, that could be really, really cool if that went well. It could be really bad if it didn't. It could be really awkward. So on Tuesday, we sketched. And so as John said, everybody sketches. So these are some of the, the folks that were in the room for Savvy Oak. And this is really important, I think, for, for a number of reasons. Partly, as John said, we get perspectives from a, a lot of different expertises when we do this. You also get everyone being involved in the beginning. And so there's a lot less concern that later on in the process, you're going to be sort of at each other's throats. But at any rate, every person sketches, and it's quiet. You know, people are spending a lot of time putting in detail. By the end of the day, we've got over 10 different competing ideas for how the robot's personality might work. But in this case, it, it turned out on Wednesday when we decided which pieces, and so Steve's making the decision about which personality components to test, that we could fit them together into one sort of super personality. So he chose three kind of risky ideas, three things that he thought, these are the sorts of things that if they went wrong after launch could really come back to haunt us in the press. So the first one was a face. And again, like the face is the thing that most likely suggests that the thing can talk and is most likely to make you, you know, frustrated if it, if it doesn't in fact respond. We, we looked at a lot of different face approaches that exist sort of both ideas that the Savio team brought in as well as ideas we saw in, you know, watching movie trailers and things like that. Um, so everything from the sort of glowing red HAL 9000 eye, which is actually pretty scary, to uh, this, which is like even scarier. Um, but we settled on, Steve chose this face, which is kind of a, a sleepy-eyed face inspired by the uh, sort of bear monster in My Neighbor Totoro, who is friendly looking, but you don't really think he's going to talk. He's kind of more of a grumbler. Um, and that seemed sort of appropriate for this kind of almost dog-like robot. And then we also talked about um, games. So one, one idea from the team was that the robot could play like hide and seek or follow the leader. And so we thought, huh, it sounded kind of weird, but Steve said, you know, let's try it. And another one was a dance. This is actually, this idea is actually suggested by my colleague, John. And I think you guys will all agree it's a stupid idea. But uh, John proposed that when the robot finished making the delivery, that it should do a dance. And he said it could just kind of like swivel and it would be like a dance. It, it's, not, it's okay, so anyway, <laughs> he convinced Steve. Steve's like, okay, we'll try it. So on Thursday, we've got to make this prototype, and we've only got like eight hours to make the robot, which is you know a functional prototype of the robot. It already works, but we've got to hack this personality onto it. So the way we do this in any sprint, and this is no exception, is to divide the work up. And it's kind of like an Ocean's Eleven style thing where everybody's doing something that they've got special expertise on. They're doing their piece of it, and then at the end, we kind of stitch it all together. So somebody's working on sound effects. Here you can see John working with our colleague Daniel on just actually putting that face into Keynote, putting that Keynote into like an animation, and then putting it onto a little iPad mini. And when you put the iPad, we pried off the front panel of the robot, put the iPad on there, and it looked like there was a sort of a digital face running on there um, full screen, and you could even touch it and interact with it. The robot normally drives on its own, uh, but to program all of the movements, all the dance, and all of the sort of choreography of moving into place at the door, we didn't have time to do that. But there's a manual override mode for the robot. And so here you can see Tessa, the CTO at Savvy Oak, just with a PlayStation remote driving it and figuring out, OK, just for five times, all we had to do was kind of Wizard of Oz that, that interaction at the door. 
because we're only going to be testing with five guests. Our colleague Daniel got a hold of the remote. You can see it's kind of potentially causing some damage to the robot. And so on Friday, we had it all worked out. We had this sort of script. We knew what everyone, the part they were going to play. And we knew we'd be able to, to pull it off for these five, these five sort of guest interviews. Now, the test with hotel guests, we wanted to test with guests at the real hotel. So we were going to be doing it at the, at the Aloft Hotel. Our colleague, Michael, who's normally teaching uh, startups how to run customer interviews, which I know a lot of you guys do, came down to do this. He was excited. So he's a picture of him in front of the hotel. And he came in uh, to the hotel room early, brought a suitcase, picture him with a suitcase. And, uh, and inside his suitcase, he's got all kinds of stuff. So he's got like drop cams and like uh, document cameras and tripods and extension cords and duct tape and you know mints because he wants to have fresh breath for all the strangers he's going to be meeting. And so with the Savio team, they kind of rigged up this basically surveillance system in the room so that we could see what would happen in the hallway and, and inside the room as the guest saw the robot for the first time. So at 9 a.m., the first guest arrives. And actually, I want you to put yourself for a second into the, the shoes of this first person who shows up because earlier in the week, you had seen an ad on Craigslist and uh, for a, a usability interview. And you filled out the form. And you said, yeah, you know, I'm going to be in Cupertino on Friday. I'll check it out. So you filled out the form. And you get this email from Michael. And it says, hey, you know, this is going to be a little different than usual. <laughs> and you're probably like, oh, huh, I don't know. But this is like you on like Wednesday. And so you're like, oh, all right, I'll check it out. But now it's like you on Friday. And you're in the lobby. And Michael shows up. And he's like, all right, come with me. And then you're like the elevator. And then you're like in Michael's room. And there's like cameras everywhere. <laughs> so but this is like just to illustrate that even in the most awkward of situations or weird of situations, you can make customers feel comfortable and get, and get very authentic reactions. So in this case, Michael's wearing his badge from work, like as if he would need his badge. But just to show like, that he's who he said he was, he's got like, even his body language is like, very non-offensive. And he's got a clipboard. And he's asking this first participant to say, like, so when you come into a hotel, where did you, you know, in this room, where would you normally put your suitcase? And she says, well, I'd probably put it over there. And he said, so. If you're unpacking and you found that you've forgotten your toothbrush, what would you do? And she says, well, you know, I'd, I'll probably call the front desk and ask them if they've got, like, an extra toothbrush or if I can buy one somewhere nearby. So he said, well, go ahead and call. Here's the phone number for the front desk. So she calls. And, and the phone number is actually for Allison, who works for Savio. And Allison answers and says, oh, I'll send a toothbrush right up. So they continue to talk, Michael asking questions. And meanwhile, we're watching. We're back at the office watching over video. So we've got this kind of like CSI kind of thing. And we're watching as the, as the robot drives down the hallway and moves into position. And normally, it would trigger that automatic phone call. But instead, Allison calls back and is like, your delivery is here. And so the, you know, the, the first customer, the guest, walks to the door. And she opens the door. And we get to watch. We had to watch like five times as if we'd fast forwarded into the future and this robot with a personality existed and we were seeing people like react to it in, in real life. And, and so that's kind of like the magic of the sprint. So what happened was d nobody wanted to play games with the robot. That was not, that was not, not fun for anyone. Um, but the face worked, actually. People were like delighted by the robot's face, but they, no one tried to actually talk to it, which was, which was great. So Savvy was like, we can do that. That's amazing. And the, the dance even worked. Uh, I, uh, the, so this is the, this is the sort of the, yeah, this is sort of the, the press for, for the robot. They got some really great, great press afterwards. And the, um, this is the robot in action. And you're going to be able to see what it looks like when John Zeratsky dances, because it's the same dance that you'll see at any, uh, you know, any kind of event with John. So, so that's the robot in real life. And it's, it's a very simple, it's a modest personality, but it has a personality. It's closer to kind of their vision for the product. And that's sort of the idea with, with a sprint. And this is kind of a wacky story, but it sort of illustrates this, this bigger idea. It's a little corny, but which we feel is important both to the success of the business and to your enjoyment of work. It is that if you're doing this long thing, and you know there's going to be all these arguments and all these potential problems, you're likely to get careful. And you're likely to not take risks. But when you can shorten the process down, you can not only try risky ideas and multiple risky ideas head to head, but you can be closer to your vision. And that's kind of a big deal. I talked at the beginning about this idea of life versus work. And of course, you guys know this. It's really not 
two things in opposition with each other. They both come from the same bank account of, of hours of your life. And I think, and we've found that when you work in this way, when you work in a sprint, and your, your time with your colleagues is like this, when it feels like Ocean's Eleven, and you're in it together, and you're all giving sort of your best expertise, your best efforts, your best ideas are evaluated together, you're working together, it's kind of why you signed up to do your job. When, my, when I was young, my dad used to always say this to me, uh, find a way to enjoy your work because you'll spend most of your life doing it, which is obviously true. Uh, he was a big fan of, of obviously true statements, uh, saying them over and over again. But um, I think about this a lot. He passed away in October, and at his memorial, there were people you know, from his family and his friends, but there were people he had worked with in his 30s and 40s, his 50s and 60s, his 70s and 80s. He worked right up until he got ill, and they talked about things they'd done together at work and good times that they'd had and important work that they'd, that they'd done. It's easy to think about making the most of your time with your family and with your friends. We all want to do that, and we know we want to be present and attentive at those times, but your time at work counts too. It's, it's coming from that same bank account. So whether you try our experiment or whether you try one of your own, I definitely encourage you to look at that weekly calendar and think about if it makes sense, if it's just a default that has sort of stuck or if it can be done better. And uh, if you do choose to try our experiment, check out our book. It's, uh, it's called Sprint. It's got stories and a DIY guide and you can find out more about it here. So thanks a lot, you guys.